السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Peace be upon you dear students Welcome back to our course critical thinking And today inshallah we're gonna deal with lecture 8 And I am Dr. Hamid Said Last lectures we've started chapter 6 Dealing with the critical thinking In confronting oration, media plies and propaganda And today we're gonna tackle a very important issue in reasoning which is errors in reasoning particularly the fallacies but first of all would like to know more details about the definitions of fallacies reasoning and fallacies as you know Reasoning refers to the way we put together an argument or explanation. And as we stated before, the argument consists of the premises and the conclusion. But what's meant by the term fallacy? In this context, the term fallacy refers to an error or flaw in reasoning. So, when someone commits an error or a flaw in the reasoning process, this is called fallacy. When that flaw or error appears to be logically correct, it is referred to as logical fallacy. So, the logical fallacy is a fallacy which appears to be logically correct while in fact it is incorrect this is very important definition here as to the definition of logical fallacy so fallacies may be created unintentionally by mistake or they may be created intentionally in order to do what in order to deceive other people or in order to do in order to uh, deceive the audience so fallacies are very dangerous devices or tools in the course of public speaking in the context of debates uh, or even the everyday uh, language everyday dialogue the vast majority of fallacies involve arguments some fallacies involve only explanations or definitions or other products of reasoning let's here try to compare fallacies mistakes and the lies sure there is some kind of difference between fallacies mistakes and lies this table may summarize these differences in case of a fallacy it is an incorrect reasoning also the mistake or a mistake is an incorrect reasoning but in case of lying just to tell lies this is a saying that contradicts reality so when someone says anything which is contradicting reality this is called lying and this is usually done intentionally while the mistake is done unintentionally in case of the fallacy a fallacy may be done intentionally or even unintentionally because it may be some kind of mistake so these the major differences between a fallacy a mistake and lie then the unethical strategies for winning arguments and manipulating people are called fallacies. So, fallacies are used for this purpose. To unethically trying to win arguments and manipulate the audience. So, they are considered dirty tricks of intellectual life or even they are considered a kind of intellectual illusion why because the man who commits 
Pharisees are try is trying to elude person and deceive them. Pharisees are also considered a violation of the basic principles of critical thinking, such as what, such as the principle of precision, the principle of consistency, the principle of relevance, the principle of acceptability, or even the principle of sufficiency. So, the term fallacy is generally used to refer to any kind of mistaken belief, what's, whatever it means. It may mean an argument which seems correct, though it is not correct. And this is the logical fallacy. It is a kind of argument which seems correct but in fact it is not correct and to put it more precisely a fallacy is an incorrect form of an argument a fallacy is an incorrect argument illogic and rhetoric at the same time which undermines an argument's logical validity and sounds so this form of incorrect argument violates the rules of validity and the rules of soundness together. They are commonly used, I mean fallacies, in convincing people. In fallacies, the focus is on communication and results rather than the correctness of the logic. Why? Because the speaker or the arguer, the arguer is trying to deceive the audience, trying to affect them by any way. They may be used whether the point is correct or incorrect. Take care here. What about the classes or types of fallacies? In fact, we have different classification of fallacies according to several bases. We may classify fallacies into formal and informal. We may classify them into deductive. Let's here define what's meant by the formal fallacies. As the name indicates here, the former fallacies are fallacious only because of their logical form. The form itself is fallacious. So they are called formal fallacies. There may be some kind of error in logic that can be seen in the argument's form. So the argument's form itself is the thing which makes the 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 argument fallacious here i mean being fallacious is due to the form not to the content of the argument all formal fallacies are specific types of non sequiturs or non logic conclusions What's meant by these phrases to be non sequitur or non logic conclusion? It means that due to the bad form of the argument, the premises do not necessarily lead to the conclusion. So it is called non logic conclusion. But what's meant by the informal fallacies? In contrary to the formal Fallacies. The informal falses here are arguments that are fallacious for reasons other than the form or the structure flows or the former flows. So they are fallacious because of the content, for example. Okay, so they usually require examination of the argument's content itself rather than the form or the structure of the argument. The slippery slope 
fallacy is an example of informal fallacies. Why? Because it is fallacious because of the content, not because of the form. Then, what about the other classification in which we classify fallacies into deductive fallacies and inductive fallacies? The deductive fallacies are assessed by deductive standards, which demand deductive validity. While in case of the inductive fallacies, they are assessed by inductive standards, which require inductive strength. Inductive strength here means making the conclusion more likely. I mean, in terms of the probability of happening of the comp conclusion here. So, the hasty generalization or the overgeneralization is an example of the inductive fallacy. Why? Because it is based on the hasty generalization, which is based on some kind of particular induction. So we've dealt before with the deduction and the induction, and we knew well the difference between them. Now let's try to deal with some common fallacies in the real life, not only in the academic life, but also in the media, in the street, in everywhere. The first one is the slippery slope, hasty generalization, common practice, ad hominem, or attacked person, appeal to authority, decomposition, composition, this is the opposite, the red herring, straw man, and finally number 10, the false dilemma, or the black and white, or the dichotomy fallacy. Let's have some more details about each of them. First, we have the slippery slope fallacy. As the name indicates here, there is some kind of slippery slope falling like this. So, but what is the point here? The slippery slope fallacy is a kind of informal fallacy. It is a kind of informal fallacies because it is fallacious because of the content, not because of the form. So it is called informal fallacy. It usually starts with a given point from which one can arrive at an undesirable conclusion through a series of incremental inferences. And because of this unwanted result, the initial starting point should be rejected. Let's tackle here the steps of the slippery slope fallacy. The slippery slope fallacy takes this form. Step one often leads to step two. Step two often leads to step three. Step three often leads to such and such until we reach an obviously unacceptable step. So, step one is not acceptable according to the unacceptability of the final step here. This is the general form of the slippery slope fallacy. Let's tackle this diagram here. Suppose we have an event called A, and this often leads to another event B, and B in turn often leads to C. C in turn often leads to D, and so on, until we reach Z, which often leads to the hell. 
The head here means undesirable result. But we do not want, for sure, to go to the hell. So we would like to avoid this result or this conclusion. So we don't take the first step A to go back again. Because this series of the series of events or incidents will lead to undesirable result like the hell here. So we have to abandon A, which is the root cause or the initial cause of this slipper loop. Let's have this diagram too. Take care here. This is a slipper loop. It is a slippery like that. And it is a sloopy like that. So here, this is the first step. It may be very innocent like that, first step. But here we have chain reaction. And this chain reaction is improbable. But what about the conclusion? The conclusion is usually a bad conclusion. So the conclusion of an argument resting on a shaky and unlikely chain of events. This form of fallacy can occur in both good arguments and the fallacious argument. I mean, the slippery slope may be used in good situation or arguments or even fallacious arguments. And the quality of an argument of this form will depend crucially on the probability of going from one step to another. So it is a matter of probability. Okay? Then the probabilities involve the argument's content, not merely its form. So it is called informal fallacy, not formal fallacy here. Let's have this example. Suppose you have decided not to go to college. This is the first step here. You have decided not to go to, to college. If we use the strategy or the policy of a slippery slope, we may complete like that. If you don't go to college, you will get a degree. If you don't get a degree, you want to get a good job. If you don't get a good job, you want to be able to enjoy life. But you should be able to enjoy life. So, you should go to college. Take care here. So, this is the initial event or the initial instance here. You have decided not to go to college. This first event or initial event is leading to the next, is leading to the next, is leading to the next, until we reach an undesirable conclusion or result here. So to avoid this undesirable conclusion or result, we have to avoid committing the first initial like this. But take you here. What about the probability of happening here? They may be probable, possible, improbable, or sometimes even impossible. So our conclusion here is completely based upon the degree of incidence here or the degree of happening of these series of events so this i mean this slippery slope fallacy is called or is a type of the informal fallacy like that okay let's move now to the next kind or type of fallacy it is the hasty generalization or the over generalization here 
A hasty generalization is a kind of inductive fallacies. To cure this is inductive, non, not, not deductive, in which we jump to conclusions by hasty generalization. I, by the way, it is a stupid but common fallacy of incorrectly applying one or two examples to all cases and the overgeneralization or the hasty generalization lies here. Why? Because we usually apply one or two examples or even few examples to all cases. And this is incorrect. And it is fallacious because we overestimate the strength of an argument, although it is not based on complete induction. So, this example, number one, I have met two people in Tokyo so far. They were both nice to me. So, all people I'll meet in Tokyo will be nice to me. So, take care here. How many people have you met in Tokyo so far? You've met only two people. And this is a little number of people. But because you used here or committed here the overgeneralization or the hasty generalization policy, you decided that as long as these two people were both nice to you, then all people you will meet in Tokyo will be nice to you. And this is incorrect. This is some kind of policy. Why? Because you, you based or you built your generalization on incomplete induction here. Let's have the second example. This person is bearded. He's a terrorist. So, all bearded men are terrorists. Sure, you agree with me? that we cannot generalize here because this is called overgeneralization or hasty generalization and this is some kind of fallacy why because you your conclusion here is supported by only few persons or only few cases during the induction process. So, to conclude, when you would like to generalize, to make a general rule for anything, you have to build this upon complete or nearly complete induction of the individuals of any situation or of any phenomenon. The next type of policy is called common practice policy and I think the name itself indicates this type of policy. This policy occurs when someone is attempting to persuade you to do something because everyone does it. Why don't you smoke? Everyone smokes. You know, why don't you do something? Everyone does it. So, he is attempting to persuade you, to motivate you to do this thing, or to believe this belief, only because everyone does it. So, this is called common practice fault. As you see, it is completely fallacious because it is based on a false assumption. What is this false assumption? When we assume that if everyone does X, then X must be right. And this completely wrong. Again, the false assumption is if everyone does X, then X must be right. But this assumption is false. Okay? Because it is based on the common practice policy here. We often use this tactic in, in our life to provide justification or to justify 
the things we usually do which are bad, which we ought not to do. So, just to, not to be blamed or to avoid being blamed by our parents, our teachers, our the people in general, we are trying and resorting to this kind of policy to avoid their blame. Let's have examples here. You should turn to channel 6. This is a TV channel, for example. It is the most watched channel this year. Okay. But it is the most watched channel. But is it the best channel? You know, this is not necessary. It is the most watched one. But it is not necessary to be the best one. So this is some kind of fallacy. You should drink Pepsi. It is the most popular soft drink worldwide. It's okay. It is the most popular soft drink worldwide. But the question is, is it the best one? This is the true question here. And this is some kind of common practice fallacy. You should be liberal. You know, liberal this is from liberalism. It is the most ideology nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yes, it may be the most popular ideology nowadays, worldwide even. But is it the best one? Is it the most acceptable one? It is the most convincing one? It is the best one, I mean. So all of these three examples are examples of common practice fallacy. And as we stated in the last lecture, and if you obey most of those upon the earth, they will mislead you from the way of Allah. They follow not accept assumption, and they are not but falsified. So take care not to follow the common practice fallacy. Take care not to adopt in your life, in your beliefs, in your deeds, the common practice fallacy. Just search for the best, then follow it. So the next fallacy here is the ad hominem or attack the person. The word ad this is Latin, means to or toward. And the word homonym means person or human. So the word ad homonym means toward or to the person. And the implied meaning here is to attack the person instead of attacking the argument or attacking the evidence. For example, here, someone, number one here, okay, he presents argument. This person, okay, is arguing with that one here on the right. So, the person on the left here presents argument. So, but this person on the, on the right rejects and dismissed this argument. But on what base? And instead of attacking the argument, and instead of refuting the argument itself, he's trying to attack the person here. Just to say to him, you are, for example, bad, a bad man, and I cannot accept anything from a bad man. So, in case of the ad hominem, or attack the person, the arguer here is trying to attack the person instead of attacking the argument. He is attacking the person instead of refuting the evidence here. So, he simply says to him, 
I reject your argument. Not because it is not acceptable, but because you are a bad man. Let's go here for more details. Ad hominem is a statement or attack against the person speaking and not the argument itself. The link between the personal attack and the matter at issue depends on the identification of the logical validity of the argument with the moral integrity of the speaker. A bad person cannot be right. So this is the rule here, which is used here. A bad person cannot be right. And this, you know, this is incorrect. So the ad hominem policy depends on this incorrect rule here, which is a bad person cannot be right. But here, as you know, we have to separate the person from the argument itself. Let's have some examples here. Example one. We cannot accept his standpoint. Why? Because we are refuting this standpoint? No. Simply because he is racist, sexist, liberal, anti-Semitic, begotten, dogmatic, dogmatic, discriminatory, etc. So here you can notice that we are not refuting the standpoint or the argument itself, but we are trying to attack the person by using names or titles like, like all of these. Something like here. Nietzsche was admitted to a mental asylum before his death. It's okay. This may be fact. So, his philosophy about the Superman is meaningless. You know, what is the relation between the philosophy of Superman adopted by Nietzsche and his going to a mental asylum before his death. This may be immediately before his death, but what about his philosophy? If you would like to refute this philosophy, I mean the philosophy of Superman, it's okay, go ahead. But don't attack Nietzsche and instead of attacking or refuting his argument or his philosophy. So you have to focus on the argument on the evidence instead of attacking the person so as not to commit the ad hominem or the attack to person policy. You see here have another example. Clinton's infidelity or disloyalty to his wife invalidates his mid east peace policy. So, take care here. There is no direct relationship between Clinton's infidelity to his wife and the Mideast peace policy. So, if you would like to criticize his policy in the Mideast peace, it's okay, go ahead. But don't attack the Mr. President, I mean Clinton, the ex presidents of the SA, don't attack the person. Try to criticize the policy of the Middle East peace. Number five here is appeal to authority. Insisting that a claim is true simply because an expert or an authority said it is true. So here we appeal to authority or we support our claim or support our argument because some kind of authority or an expert just said it is true without any other supporting evidence offered here. What about the logical form of this policy? 
an authority said that x is true therefore x is true is that correct no absolutely no why because of a lot of things we appeal to authority to back up our reasoning and but take care here most reasoning of this kind is not fallacious why because much of our knowledge in life probably comes from authority but we have to ask a very important question here what kind of authorities are acceptable here in this context so appealing to authority as a reason to believe something is fallacious when take these conditions when the authority appealed to is not really an authority in this particular subject and when the authority cannot be trusted to tell the truth because of uh, several reasons he is not trusted he cannot be trusted to tell the truth although he is still an authority even in a particular field also when authorities disagree on this subject number four when the reasoner or the arguer misquotes the authority here there is some kind of misquotation so if there is one of these four among others so we cannot appeal to this authority in case of the appeal to authority spotting a fallacious appeal to authority often requires some background knowledge about the subject and about the authority himself so when you're trying to appeal to authority or when you listen to someone who appeals to authority you have to have a big knowledge about the subject he's dealing with and the authority he's appealing to in brief it can be said that it is fallacious to accept the words of a supposed authority when we should be suspicious of the authority's words if there's some kind of suspicion so we cannot accept the words or the judgment or the evaluation of the authority we appealed to for example we have this and this is by the way valid authority here but take care richard dawkins who is an evolutionary biologist and perhaps the foremost expert in the field said that evolution is true therefore it's true take care here we are appealing to an authority and this authority is an expert in the same field why because richard dawkins is an expert and a scientist and big scholar in the field of evolution and he is a reputed biologist but take care here can we simply say because he believed that evolution is true we can say it's a true the answer is absolutely no why because there are several biologists who are specialists and experts in the field of evolution who may refute or criticize the theory of evolution i mean the question is is there a consensus among all the biologists on the 
theory of evolution? If there is, so we can accept the theory. But as long as there is, you know, here there is some kind of disagreement among them on this theory, we cannot accept something like that just because someone says it is true. In this example, example number two, I mean, we have a fourth authority. When we say the president of our neighborhood association said that the moon is covered with dust. Take care here. Who said that? The president of our neighborhood. He is not an expert. He is not a scientist or even an expert in the science of uh, the moon, space, etc. So we cannot say, therefore, the moon is covered with dust. Why? Because you appealed to an authority, and at the same time, this authority is a false authority. And this is the commonest or the most common type of appeal to authority fallacy here. Some people usually appeal to a false authority. In example three, we have a false authority too. The store Muhammad Salah always presents the advertising of Pepsi. The career. What is the relation between Muhammad Salah as a footballer or a star in the field of football and Pepsi and drinking Pepsi and the quality of the soft drinks? There is no relation here. So you are resorting to or you are appealing to a false authority again. So this is a false why? Because you cannot say Pepsi must be the best soft drink. And accordingly, we must drink only Pepsi. All of these are, are fallacies and the fallacious. Why? Because you appeal to a false authority here. And even if he is a true authority or a valid authority, we have to ask the regular question, is there some kind of consensus among the experts or the science in this field? This is a very important question here. Okay. The policy number six is the decomposition or division policy. It occurs when we argue that if an argument applies to the whole, it must apply to its parts. Or when someone assumes that a characteristic of a group is also a characteristic of all its individuals. So here we decompose because we apply the rule of the whole to the rule of its supports. And this is incorrect and this considers a kind of fallacy here. Let's have these examples. If we say the UAE is a rich state. The United Arab Emirates is a rich state. Mr. Gassim is from the United Arab Emirates. Therefore, Mr. Gassim must be rich. Is that correct? Exactly no. Why? Because this is some kind of fallacy. It is called the decomposition or the division fallacy. It is not necessary to be rich, even if the state or the Emirates themselves is a rich state. Example two. Mr. Ahmed's family is very rich. Mr. Ahmed must be very rich. There's a conclusion here. And this is another example of the decomposition fallacy. Why? Because it is not necessary for Ahmed to be rich. 
even if his family is very rich. Why? Because there may be some people, including Ahmed, in this family who are still poor, not rich, or, or, or even very rich, sure. Example three, team A is successful. Mr. Ali is a member of team A. Therefore, he must be successful. Is that correct? No. And this is some kind of decomposition or division fallacy. Why? Because the team as a whole may be successful. But this does not mean that every individual or every member of the team individually is successful. The same goes for example number four. When we say the human body contains 600% water, therefore the normal brain contains 600% 600, 600 water. This is incorrect because it is not necessary for the brain to contain 600% of water even if the human body contains 600% water. Because the water content of in different organs may vary a lot. The fallacy number seven is the composition fallacy. And this is the opposite of decomposition fallacy. This fallacy occurs when we argue that if an argument applies to the parts, it must apply to the whole. Or when someone assumes that a characteristic of some or all the individuals in a group is also characteristic of the group itself. And as you see, it is the converse or the opposite of the decomposition or the division fallacy. Here we have some examples again. Each human cell is very lightweight. A human being is composed of cells. So, a human being is also very lightweight. Is that correct? No, this conclusion is not correct. Why? Because it is not necessary to apply the rule of the parts here to all the body or the human being here. Number two again, Mr. Ahmed is very rich. His family must be very rich. This conclusion is fallacious too. Why? Because it is not necessary for Ahmed's family to be rich even if Ahmed is very rich. In number three, the normal brain contains 73% water. Therefore, the human body contains 73% water. This is also fallacious. The conclusion is incorrect. Why? Because it is not necessary for the body to contain 73% water even if one organ like the brain contains 73% water. I think this is very clear. And the composition fallacy is the opposite or the converse of the decomposition fallacy as we stated before. Let's move now to a very interesting fallacy which is called the red herring fallacy. As you know, a red herring is a smelly fish that would distract even a bloodhound. And as you know, the bloodhound is a famous kind of or breed of dogs which can easily detect any smell and can follow any kind of smell. So it is used, commonly used in detection of uh, thieves, uh, drugs, etc. 
but using the smelly fish like the red herring may distract even this breed of dog and as you know a red herring is one that has been salted dried and smoked all the times and it has a powerful and distinctive odor and this is the image of this type of fish so in our context here there is something called the red herring fallacy what about this kind of fallacy and why is it called like that a red herring is a fact idea or subject that takes people's attention or audience attention away from the central point being considered in argument a red herring describes a statement introducing an unrelated point to distract the audience's attention away from addressing the point under debate so it is used as a digression or deviation that leads the reasoner off the track of considering only relevant information by distracting the attention of someone away from the real argument by using an irrelevance. An intentional false lead in a criminal investigation is a common example of a red herring. Let's have this example. The judge should rule against the charge of financial corruption of a chief executive officer CO. Take care here. The judge should do what should rule against the CO because he committed some kind of financial corruption. But someone is defending the CO. Take care here. He's trying to distract the attention of the judge away from the main point which is the financial corruption to another thing the CEO is popular with shareholders and the presides over a healthy company so the reasoner tries to dis digress and distract the judge's attention away from the main charge to the CEO's popularity and success as a reason to rule against the charge of financial corruption. You notice that the premise is intended to make the audience supportive of the CEO and think that he is successful in his role as a CEO, thus unreceptive to the idea that he should be convicted of misconduct. So here the defender is trying to distract the attention of the judge away from the central point, which is the charge here of financial corruption, to another thing, which is the uh, popularity of um, the CEO, the, his success story in managing the, the company, etc. And because he is trying to distract the attention of the judge, it is called here the red herring fallacy. Because the red herring usually distracts the follower. Okay, like the dog, for example. Here, this diagram summarizes the policy of the red herring. The CEO here is accused of financial corruption. So, so he should be convicted. Again, the CEO is accused of financial corruption. So he should be convicted. By the defender here is trying to distract the attention of the judge okay to another thing 
such as his successful managing of the company and this would be a big distractor of the judges away from the central point here and because this distracted attention here it is called the red herring fallacy you know this is very common and used by uh, in politics about the politicians by um, persons in debates etc just to try to take you away from your central point and try to distract your attention like that. Example number two. When the next tax and Senate Bill 47 unfairly hurt business, this is a question. Will the new tax and Senate Bill 47 unfairly hurt business? Someone here is trying to distract the audience's attention away from this question. He said, I noticed that the main provision of the bill is that the tax is higher for large employee, employers as opposed to small employers. To decide on the fairness of the bill, we must first determine whether employees who work for large employers have better working conditions than employees who work for small employers. Take care here. He's trying to distract our attention away from the Senate Bill 47 and whether it unfairly hurts the business, you know, to distract us toward working conditions you know in case of the uh, big employers and the small employers and this thing is not relevant at all to our central point here even he completed like that i'm ready to volunteer for a new committee to study this question how do you suppose the committee should go about collecting the data we need you know, he, he tried to distract our attention away from the central point here just to make us thinking in the working conditions, uh, just how to form the new committee and how this committee uh, going to collect the data, etc. So, this is the red herring fallacy example again. And this is the explanation. Bringing up the issue of working conditions and the committee is the red herring, diverting or digressing us from the main issue whether Senate Bill 47 un unfairly hurts business or not. Okay. We have here a table. And these are three other examples of red herring fallacies. And this, the explanation of each of them, you can revive this, no problem. The fallacy number one is interesting too. It is called the straw man fallacy. And it is called the straw man because there is there's some kind of similarity between this fallacy and the straw man, which is used in you know in fields just to distract uh, 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 the the birds etc. This fallacy, I mean the straw man fallacy, occurs when opponents' point of view is distorted or misrepresented in order to make it easier to refute. This fallacy occurs when an arguer ignores the opponent's real position on an issue and sets a weaker version of it by misrepresentation of it. According to this fallacy, a person is reported to have said something he or she has not stated, stated at all. What are the steps of Strobman fallacy? 
First of all, a person weakens, distorts, or overstates, or misrepresents the original argument by disregarding the evidence. After weakening or distorting the argument, this the original argument is replaced with the weakened or, or misrepresented or distorted version. Then, the distorted version is then attacked, proven faulty and dismissed. Let's tackle this ship. First of all, you would like to follow this, the, the straw man policy? First of all, you have to distort the original argument. After distorting the original argument, replace it with the distorted version. Then attack the distorted version because it will be very easy to refute the distorted one or to criticize the misrepresented one. So these are the three steps by which we use the straw man fallacy. And as you, you, you can see here, it is very uh, deceptive kind of fallacy. Because first, you distorted the original argument and replace it with the distorted version. Then you attack this distorted or misrepresented version again. Let's have some examples here. When we say vegetarians say animals have feelings like you and me, you know this is the argument of the vegetarians. They say vegetarian they say that animals have feelings like you and me, so we shouldn't eat them. But if you would like to refute this argument or dismiss this argument using the straw man fallacy, you may say some kind of exaggeration. Ever seen a cow laugh at Shakespeare comedy? Take care here. You are misrepresenting the argument. You are exaggerating here using this question. Trying to distort the argument and trying to replace the original argument with the distorted one. After that, to dismiss it is very easy. Just to say, vegetarianism is nonsense. So you dismiss this distorted version of the argument. Another example here, industrialization is the cause of global warming. Someone is arguing like that. Industrialization is the cause of global warming, but someone else may use the straw man fallacy to dismiss this argument, just to say all ill that beset mankind are due to industrialization. Take care here. He distorted and misrepresented the original argument then he easily dismissed it like that. And you can notice two things went wrong here. The proponent does not hold B. Take care here. And even if he or she did, the falsity of B does not apply the falsity of A. here. So this is the straw man falsity. It is very deceptive like that because it, it, it includes uh, some kind of distortion or misrepresentation, some kind of replacement, and finally dismissing the original argument of the uh, proponent. The last kind here of fallacies is the false dilemma fallacy. It is called the false dilemma fallacy, or even black or white fallacy, or the false dichotomy. And you know the word dichotomy means two, okay? But it is the false dichotomy here. 
The black or white fallacy is a false dilemma fallacy that limits you unfairly to only two choices, as if you were made to choose between black and white. According to this fallacy, the arguer pretends that there are only two options, while in fact there are more and more. For example, well, it's time for decision. Will you contribute $20 to our environmental fund? Or are you on the side of, of environmental destruction? I'll take care here. He limited the audience to only two options. Whether they have to contribute or otherwise they are on the side of environmental destruction while there are several and several options here not to be only two options like that example two i must pass calculus or my life will be ruined oh no take care here he limited us again into two options. Either he passes calculus or his life will be ruined. But in fact, there are several other several options here. In example three, citizens must choose between supporting gun control and supporting murder. Take care again. Is limiting the choices into only two either supporting gun control or supporting murder how can we diagnose the false dilemma false the key for example to determine whether the limited menu is fair or unfair simply saying will you contribute $20 or want you is not unfair. The black or white fallacy is often committed intentionally in jokes, such as um, my toaster has two settings, burn it and off. You know, so what about uh, operation? What about different levels of operation, for example? But this is jock, as you know. In thinking about this kind of fallacy, it is helpful to remember that everything in ease is either black or not black, not black or white. It is black or not black. I mean, we have several colors, not only black and white. It is not always dichotomous. We have several options in life. But not everything is either black and white. We have a very famous example here for the false dilemma fallacy. As you know, after September 11 attacks, President Bush stood before Congress and vowed to use every resource available to defeat global terrorism. Mr. Bush said, many countries have offered sympathy and support to the United States. The rest, he said, face a choice. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists, he said. This is a very famous of the false dilemma fallacy. Why? Because he divided the world into two opposite camps. Either you are with the United States or you are with the terrorists. Let's Listen and watch this. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. The point now is how to confront the fallacies, how to face fallacies. To do so, you have to separate facts from judgment. There is a difference between 
facts and judgments facts and opinions number two you have to look for the motive the motivation be behind making this these fallacies number three checking collaboration number four judging expertise we can appeal or can resort to the experts but we have to resort to uh, uh, an expert who is a valid expert in the field or in a particular area of research etc and we have to search for consensus this is very important also we have to decide on the ability to see what happened we have to look for vested interest we have to make assumptions explicit not implicit and we have to come to a judge i think this is the end of our lecture till seeing you i would to, i would like to repeat again don't try to change the world you'd better change yourself before trying to change the world dear students i wish you the best of luck till seeing you assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh